Mm. While my buddy Brad is helping me install this Mitsubishi Mini Split, we are cutting up the Intello like crazy. And this is actually a really useful thing about the interior air sealing shroud, is that if you need to get in there, you just cut it and then you tape over the cut later. So this makes it all really, really simple. It's not spray foam that we have to dig out. It's not this very simple spot air sealing that I have to remember every single little seam uh, that's going in there. So this can be really useful. So let's check out what's going on with the heat pump. Fast forward to the outside unit. Again, this is Brad Lemley. He's a friend of mine from high school who magically is the air conditioning expert where I come from, where we're building the tiny lab. So Brad, anything that you wanna um, say about installing this on a tiny house on wheels? Uh, just size constraints. You gotta, everything's gotta get put in a little bit different positions. <laughs> Clearances are a lot tighter, so uh, it just takes a little bit longer to put it together. So I wanna point out one lesson learned here which is that that hole right there, which I made in a hurry because I wanted to make sure that Brad had what he needed, I was not thinking that day. And I drilled through my siding with a hole uh, saw, which is like this. And then I kept on going right through my weather barrier, which tore my weather barrier in a huge ragged hole, which now I can't reach because that air gap that's in there, that's all I can get at, is 3 8 inch. So, I did the best that I possibly could to fix that issue, but for anybody who's going to be doing that in the future, make sure that you drill your, your hole in your siding and then stop and then cut the hole very nicely in your weather barrier so that you can then tape it later. Don't be an idiot. So we're going to go ahead and proceed with the installation of this very nice Mitsubishi Mini Split. Again, this is a ductless system. It's going to deliver full control. It's got the infrared sensor, which we're going to get into in a little bit. Um, so we're going to go ahead and install this thing so that it's ready to go and roadworthy. And we're back. Different day. It started raining the other day when we were installing this with Brad, and you cannot install these in the rain uh, because moisture is one of the main things we're trying to protect against inside the line set. We're going to get into that in a minute with this test that Brad's going to walk us through. So in the first place, uh, what we have in any heating and cooling system, and specifically, let's just talk about air conditioning because it's a very simple way to do this. It's not a furnace where you're burning something in order to get heat. An air conditioner is a very elegant form of cooling. Uh, and when you use it for heating, it's called a heat pump and it just runs in reverse. All you have are two fans, one outside, which is right here, and one inside, which is what blows the air that you feel coming out of the registers or out of your mini split cartridge, which is what you have in the tiny lab, and one refrigerant loop. That's it. So the refrigerant loop is what we're really paying special attention to today because the two fans just came from the factory. They should be working perfectly as long as we haven't blocked them with anything. That means for those of you who push a couch in front of your giant return register in the wall, don't do that. That's terrible. Uh, so we don't have to worry about that here because we've really designed the air to be able to move very freely. And that means that we've offset this by four inches off the back wall here. So it has lots and lots of air to breathe to blow through the coil and really uh, change the state of this refrigerant. So, Brad, uh, what is happening with the refrigerant line right now? What are we prepping for? Basically, all we're doing is we're creating a vacuum. By putting a vacuum on the system, you are changing the boiling point of water. So that way you can boil the moisture out. In Florida, it's real important, especially because our humidity stays usually 90% or plus. So even with rain or without it, the humidity is going to eat you up. Mm -hmm. So you got to get that out of there or eventually it becomes, uh, it, will, it will turn into an acidic issue where you, where, you, where you burn the windings out of the compressor because the acid will eat them up. So it's real good to get all the, uh, get the, get all the vapor, get all the um, moisture out of it and just make sure it's clear. And we achieve that with a, with a micron test. Great. So this gauge is a vacuum gauge. There are other gauges that you'll see an air conditioning technician use. They just whip them out all the time. Now, the main problem and the reason why I put a gaugeless test in my book, Home Performance Diagnostics, is that the system is designed to be a sealed system. And as soon as uh, either a leak springs in it, or as soon as you break into the system with a set of gauges, now we've got the, the balance changing. So in fact, Brad, are we even testing the Freon right now with this test? No, all we're doing is pulling the uh, pulling a vacuum. The, the machine, the, the outside condenser comes with the pre-charge from the factory. It's already got the Freon in it. Uh, it's it's blocked off at a set of valves at the side here where you make your connections with your lines and your head unit. Once you achieve your vacuum, you're basically we're only pulling moisture out from the back of the unit here 
up to the head unit, so we're just making sure everything that's been open has its moisture and everything taken out. Uh, the Freon won't actually be touched until after the Micron test, where we just open it and allow it to go back into the system. Cool. So what we're testing right now is just the pipes, which are the two, the bigger one and the smaller one, there's the liquid line and the suction line, that are empty right now. And we want to make sure there's nothing in there except for the vacuum that we're creating. Yeah. Well, yes, and we're testing the evaporator head. The evaporator head um, attaches to it. We're also we're also evacuating that whole system up there. So we're evacuating everything except just the outside condenser. Cool. To make just sure, to make sure it's full of has no uh, full of goodness. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so no leaks. No, more no water. That's really important. Now, what happens? Uh, first of all, how long is this test going to take? In Florida, around here, usually a micron test on just a real small mini split like this on average is about two hours. Sometimes it can be a little bit longer, just depending on the moisture and uh, making sure you have a good sealed system. People do this test on every system that they install, right? Everyone does this. They're supposed to. They're supposed but, to, uh, is the short answer. Probably, uh, I would probably say 90% of your AC guys don't even have a micron gauge. Mm -hmm. They don't even use them. They just put a quick vacuum on it. They have no idea whether they pull all the moisture out, which is usually what leads to the majority of the uh, failed compressors is, you know, just at the very start from the get-go, they weren't evacuated properly. Okay. So if you don't do this test, then what happens? It, it won't happen immediately. It could take a couple of years, but the moisture will become acidic, and that, is, that acid will go in there. It tears up the windings in the compressor, and then, you know, a couple of years down the road, you're changing your compressor. If I was just an air conditioning guy who didn't necessarily care about quality and giving my clients the real goods, which by the way, clients cost money. So don't think you can get this all for free. This costs money to have somebody who's quality who knows how to do this stuff. If I didn't do this test and I just slapped it on there and opened it up and let the free out of the system, that's kind of job security for me, right? Because <laughs> their system's going to break down. They're going to have to call me back to fix it, right? Eventually, yes. The average person doesn't realize that the main source of their failure was from the get-go just not performing a micron test, mm -hmm. just putting a full vacuum and making sure it was moisture-free. Okay. So let's say that I'm a homeowner who wants to um, just upgrade to a really high sear air conditioner, which is really high efficiency, and this test doesn't get done. And there's, let's just assume for the sake of argument that there is no moisture in the line set, that actually it's, it's all fine, but there is air in there. What happens? Well, if there's air in there, there's going to be a, a hint of moisture, and mm -hmm. it's just that's, that's just part of it. I don't t I don't think there's hardly anywhere where you're going to see zero percent humidity in the air. <laughs> and is the efficiency going to be what's stated on the sticker? It, uh, no, if you don't if you don't perform a full vacuum and get all the air out and um, you know make sure that's good, it it will be a slight decrease in efficiency on top of the chance of acid in the system. Mm -hmm. And then the other area with big stuff is just airflow. You don't usually have that with mini splits because you know as long as you get them in the right placement and the heads are you know clear they're gonna they're gonna get the efficiency but with homes the ductwork is usually the biggest cause of problem they don't people upgrade to a great big high efficiency machine but they don't put um, the correct ductwork to move the air and get the static pressures where they need to be so you tear up blower motors on the left and right all the time and if you were to test it you're not getting the efficiency that you're paying for yeah. so if they're not willing to do all the proper proper ways to get that air moving, then you might as well not buy that high efficiency machine because, you know, it might say 20 sear on it, but you might be more or less down at 12 or 13. You're mm -hmm. just, you're paying for a nice machine, but you're not getting it. Yeah, totally. Which is one of the beauties of this Mitsubishi ductless mini split. Ductless is the key word because as Brad said, ducts are one of the main causes of all of the issues that we have with this stuff. So what we're going to be able to do is just jump over that hurdle completely and have all of the air delivered exactly where we want it in the room where we're trying to deliver it. You had mentioned that this test is going to take us about two hours. In a normal sized house, how long does this test normally take? It can vary majorly depending on the size of the machine, the coil sizes, how long the lines are going to the air handler. Um, I've seen them go as quickly as six hours and I've seen them take as long as uh, 10 to 15. So it just it depends on the setup, how long your lines are, and uh, how much moisture was introduced during the time while you had it open. Okay, cool. So remember, homeowners, to ask for this because there are professionals in your area who know how to do this stuff. Don't think that you don't have any. Just you need to look for them and you know what to ask for. You're asking for diagnostics because that is the key. You can get the proof that you're getting what you paid for. Um, so find people like Brad and Uplifting Air in your area and make sure that this stuff happens. So let's go ahead and start the test here and let's, uh, if you would, walk us through as we do this. 
basically with a micron test you have no need for they don't want you to run them through gauges and all those extra long hoses you want the shortest hoses you can get uh, just helps you achieve your your numbers faster make sure you got all good tight connections and fittings any air leaks and you'll never reach the 500 microns it'll just it'll run and run and run so if you don't reach it then more or less you you've got a leak somewhere you'll come back find your leak and you can start over again and do it again but uh, we've pretty well got some fresh new lines always uh, most guys don't do this but you're supposed to change your oil and your vacuum pump after every single evacuation I know most guys don't but um, you know you should <laughs> once we get it down to 500 microns we're going to close off the close off the lines at the valve here you you want to you want to shut off valve um, between your pumps you can shut it off and it should be able to maintain it for half an hour if it uh, if it holds for half an hour, you know you've got a good, you know, moisture-free system. You have no leaks in any of your connections, and your system's pretty much ready to go. You're ready to release the charge. All right, let's do it. And we're running. That beautiful sound is the sound of science at work. So we'll tune in at the end here when we've proven whether we have a leak-free system, and we will not have to have Brad back out, in which case we should pay him for the fact that he has guaranteed that he will not have to be back out to fix problems that he caused. Uh, and so we'll see you in just a few minutes. So now, several hours later, it's sunset. Uh, good news is our test found something. We found that we have a very small pinhole leak, which you would never have known about until you had uh, system problems and you weren't comfortable and the, there was smelly, gross stuff going on in the house and there was condensation on the walls and then you call the repair person and he comes out and maybe doesn't do any tests at all like Brad uh, is competing with. So Brad ran the test and he found What's going on? So now, what's the next step? Once we reach 500 and we turned off the, the pump and sealed this up and it, we found out that it wasn't actually staying at 500, um, meaning that there was pressure relief in the system, what happens next? With the mini splits, because you have compression fittings, there's four of them that we put in, uh, we're just gonna go back over the, the areas and see if we can't find it. Um, I've already started spraying them and after waiting a good, good while, I've got one that just barely, barely shows a little hint of something. We're gonna to try to tighten it up and then start back over with this vacuum again. So you basically repressurize the system instead of sucking on it, we're pressurizing it, and then you just use this soap bubble solution, which is actually specially made for this, so don't just use soap. Uh, and we find, just like with the plumbing, the leak is always gonna be at one of the places where you mess with it, because solid copper pipe doesn't actually leak except where you stop it and put on some kind of a fitting, but now you're gonna transition into the evaporator coil or the condenser coil. So we fixed the one tiny leak that we found uh, by just tightening up the nut very carefully, but that didn't actually solve the problem. We were still kind of not keeping at the pressure. So we tested it all night last night. Now here we are again today, and Brad is testing with nitrogen. What he's gonna do is pressurize the entire system with nitrogen, which is not an ingredient in water, uh, and we're gonna blow all of the potential water out of there because uh, his expert opinion is that potentially because we put this thing together and then just put tape over the line set, which is those copper lines that are gonna hold the Freon, uh, tape is not a good sealant, the kind of tape that we and use. And we left right? it for about three weeks. And we left it for three weeks in Florida which is the wettest place in the entire country. So uh, the, the idea is that now there's so much water in there that potentially, based on what uh, he's been reading, it's turned to ice because of the vacuum effects and, the, and all of the things to do with the system, which I am not an expert in. But um, potentially now it's much harder to get that out. So we're gonna purge it several times with nitrogen and really try to blow it out and retest. And now after that mad rush of configuring the system and commissioning it, we have it running. We're out on the Proof is Possible Tour. The tiny lab is parked next to a busy highway. You can hear the cars. You can hear the wind. You cannot hear this thing run. I'm putting my mic up right next to it. Uh, it is dead quiet. And so we're constantly having this run while we have people in the house. Just so I can point it and say, hey, that thing is running right now. And people say, but I can't hear it. That's the point. Also, you can see the blade turning very slowly, and that's that inverter technology where we want to vary the capacity of how much cooling we're delivering. Let's go check out the inside. Mission accomplished. Cool, dry house on an 85 degree day. This air conditioner is running right now. It's my favorite. Uh, makes no sound whatsoever. It is running right now, and you can see that with the green light that's right here. Right underneath the green light, you can see this little guy 
which is spinning back and forth if you watch it for a little while. Uh, it is the infrared IC sensor. That is scanning the room to find all of the hottest spots and it will change the vane's directionality and send the cool air to where it is needed the most within the room. And in the wintertime, it reverses the process and it sends the heat to where it's coldest. That is super sexy and in my opinion, the high quality that everyone is looking for out of their home improvement. So I hope that seeing how our HVAC system was installed and tested really helped you with your own projects in the future, whether you're a consumer or a professional. I hope that you come and see this thing for yourself and listen to how it sounds and feel what it makes this house feel like. Uh, and you can do that on the Proof is Possible website, which is proofispossible.com. We're going to 20 cities. I hope that you subscribe to our channel to ch uh, check out new updates on home performance in general and tune in next time. Wait. I misspoke a few minutes ago. Now, I want to just tell you something about Brad. Back in high school, when I was, uh, I'm a little older than he is, and when I was 17, I watched him. I stepped into his garage of his family, and he had taken apart his father's car. And with the engine was hanging, and he was kind of fixing the entire truck. So that was my introduction to Brad's technical know-how. And then he worked on race cars and on planes and all this stuff. So. He's coming from a very uh, mechanical and a very nuanced understanding of this. And I misspoke a few minutes ago because I'm used to normal split systems like in what most people's homes. There's an outdoor condenser uh, with a compressor and then there's an indoor evaporator that's got an expansion valve on it. Uh, now, when I called it the suction line and the liquid line, tell us why that was not exactly right. Technically, on a mini splits, uh, there that's not exactly correct because the condenser outside is where the metering device or where the metering first takes place, and so technically, evaporation starts after that valve. So both of those lines are actually considered suction line. They're both low pressure, so you can't really just throw gauges on them and check them. Um, so normally, one the the refrigerant comes into the compressor, gets compressed down to a really hot gas goes into the condenser coil, which is where the fan is blowing all the air over it, and it turns into a liquid at that point. Then it travels as a liquid to inside to the evaporator coil. It goes through an expansion valve. A liquid line, which is right. what you call it. Exactly. And then it expands into a gas in the evaporator coil. That's where it evaporates. Um, but in this case, you're saying that it goes in, turns into a liquid, uh, goes through the coil and then turns into a gas before it even makes it back inside or it is in the process it's of it. A, it's, it's flashing. It's, it's in the evaporation process, but it's already at low pressure before it even comes out of either one of those lines. So both of those lines are cold, not, not one warm and one cold. Great. So, so it's already technically gone and it's starting the flashing process already. Okay. And so I'm sorry if that's really technical for those of you who are watching who are not ready for that, but the bottom line of all of this is that if you do not do the test that we are doing right now, this micron test, you cannot test the Freon later to see if there is a leak later on without doing a leak test with a leak detector. Um, because you can't hook a set of gauges up to this because it's not a normal system. Mini splits are different. So yeah, if, you, if you hook up a set of gauges to one of these after the charge is released, you cannot tell where the Freon level is. Anybody says they can is guessing. Um, the only right way to know with a mini split if you have the correct Freon charge is you have to fully evacuate it and weigh it back in by the chart right on the side of the machine because uh, there is no way to just put a gauge on it and say, yeah, I'm a little low or I'm a little high or, you know, because you're reading everything after the EEV, the electronic expansion valve. Exactly. Okay, so for those of you who are installing a mini split, make sure that you do this test because you can't do a test later on without taking all of the refrigerant back out, weighing it all, and then putting it all back in, which is way more expensive. So thank you for clarifying that. I appreciate it.